Amen. That is our prayer, that the kingdom will come. If you've got your Bibles with you this morning, we are going to be in Luke chapter 11. We've finished our study in the revelation of Jesus Christ, and we're going to move back to where we left off uh, about a year and a half ago. Uh, So Luke chapter 11, we're going to cover the first four verses as we sang it this morning. Uh, And once you get there, if you don't mind standing in reverence to the reading of God's word. Luke writes, one day Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. And so he said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, for as we also forgive everyone who sins against us. And lead us not into temptation. Let's pray. Lord God Almighty, we lift up your mighty name this morning, Father. You are God. You are holy and righteous God. You are above all things. Father, as we come together in your house this morning, we, we ask that we uh, are bringing your kingdom about. Father, your kingdom is coming, that we, your church, are doing what we're called to do to help glorify you and move that along. And Father, we ask that where we fall short, that you would forgive us. We pray that you'll provide each and everything that we need, Lord, and that you'll just be our, in our forefront. Father, go with us as we go through this service, that what we do and say be pleasing unto you. And Lord, we just pray for, uh, for your will be done in all things. We ask this in Jesus' mighty and blessed name. Amen. Well, uh, as I was studying this past week, I, I kind of debated on exactly where we needed to go. We've been in Revelation of Jesus Christ for, for such a long time. Um, and there were several books that actually came to mind before we, I decided on Luke. Uh, at the top of the list was Hosea. We had thought about going there. Uh, I was speaking with James, and, and we were discussing on where we might want to go. And uh, because he's going to be preaching a couple Sundays here in about a month. And then we, we looked at a couple of other minor prophets. We, we thought about the book of James. Uh, frankly, just because it's summertime and there's a lot of traveling that goes on in the summertime. I mean, folks going on vacation, uh, sickness, just, just the busy, busyness of life. And then, you know, I thought, Lord, wh- where do you think that we need to go? And the, the concept of prayer just kept going, coming up over and over And over again, and I remembered about a year ago that we had left off in the Gospel of Luke. We hadn't finished it yet. And so, you know, it was almost as if God said, this is where you need to go. You you need to talk about prayer and and what more, go to Luke chapter 11 and pick up where you left off and and talk about prayer. Because, beloved, we need prayer. I mean, with all that's going on in the world right now, uh, you guys know the shape of our country, the leadership that we have, uh, the economy. Even the growth in our church, uh, just everyday things as well. Things are going on in your families, sickness. There is so much that is going on around us. And a lot of us do a pretty good job of managing that. I mean, you come in here, we dress up nice. uh, But all in all, going on in our life, there's so many things that that are kind of bringing us down that we need to pray. And so prayer is the acknowledgement that our need of God is not optional. It's not an optional thing. We need God completely and totally. And so basically us praying is saying, Lord, we need you. God, we need you to fix the sound system here because it's scaring some people to death. And so how do we communicate with God? Well, the scripture tells us that we pray. We, we pray to him. In our text, what we're seeing here is we've just came out. If, if you remember about a year ago, which I didn't, I had to go back and look. We, we finished up. Jesus had visited Mary and Martha. Martha had, uh, or Mary is sitting at his feet. 
you know. And, and so we're, we're watching him now, and, and the text tells us he's with the disciples. They've been praying, which prompted the question, how do we pray? Now, it's not that they didn't know how to pray. They have prayed before. They have been with Jesus. They have saw him pray. But they want to make sure they're praying in the right way. I mean, if, if there is a, a right way to pray, Lord, how do we do that? And so what we have here is a model prayer. Now, it's not that we can't communicate with God any other way. You can talk to God just as I am talking to you right now. I drive in my truck often and I just have a conversation with God. That is fine to do. But if you want to do things the right way, if there was a model way to do it, Jesus gives us the example here. And since he prays quite often, I think that we ought to be individuals that pray quite often as well. And so he models for us a life that is totally dependent upon the Father. We saw that all through his life. When we're going to look through Luke, we see that he consistently goes back to the Lord. And he gives us some instruction here on how we're to pray, which lays a foundation for anybody who wants to follow after him. And I hope that every single one of you want to do that. So as we grow in our faith, this is how we pray. And I have to admit, I'm just going to say this up front. As your pastor, I don't always pray as much as I know that I should. There's a lot of things that I fail in. So, so don't think that you have to be exactly perfect in everything. But this is encouraging for us here to know that we can learn, we can grow in our faith and in the habits that we have. And so if you're struggling as I am struggling often, let it, our Lord instructs us on how to do things here. And it, I hope that today gives you a little bit of benefit and, and an encouragement. This is the last time, as I said, that we were in Luke, which is a while ago. We saw that they were sitting at Jesus' feet and they're listening to his words. Now, it's, that's something that's necessary, but we also need to communicate back with him. In prayer, And so the text here in Luke, uh, today's text and next week's text are going to be concerning on the theme of prayer. Today's text is often called the Lord's Prayer, but uh, it, it, it's not the Lord. Jesus does not have to ask for forgiveness. Uh, so this is more aptly titled the Disciples Prayer. Uh, and so anybody who wants to follow him and be a disciple, this is the prayer that the Lord gives as the model prayer. It's pretty similar to the prayer that's found uh, in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 6. There's a little bit of difference, though. If, you, if you've noticed, this is a shorter version. And that tells us a couple of things uh, here in this prayer. Jesus probably spoke this often. We have the two disciples, uh, or we, we, we have one disciple and Dr. Luke who gives us this example but he probably taught it many times. And every time, as you guys know, when you pray, you don't say the same thing over and over again. And so it doesn't have to be repetitious. But the context and the content are pretty much similar for us. In fact, if you go to Matthew and you read that prayer, one of the things that Jesus says after that prayer in Matthew chapter 6, verse 7, he says, don't be repetitive. Don't, don't just be like the, the Pharisees and just repeat things over and over and over again because those prayers are empty. And we don't want to have empty prayers. In fact, we, we want our, our prayers to be sincere. We want them to be focused and intentional. And we want them to, to get God's purpose in our life and also our family's needs. And so we see both of those things. We're going to break this prayer down into two things. Okay, the first is the Father's purpose. And, and in that, we're going to see that his name is, is set apart from everything else that God has glorified. And also that his kingdom comes, that, that, that God is, is at the forefront of everything. And the second thing that we see here is that our, our needs are met. And so in everything, whether it's God's purpose or our family, God is looking out for us. God's provision is there uh, for, in the forefront. And so when the Israelites came out of Egypt, when we look at prayer... The first thing that they had to learn was that God was going to be their provider. That God was going to be their protector. He was the one that was going to fight the battles. They just had to follow, right? God, God's going to provide everything for them. They, don't, they have a need for water. 
God provides water. They have a need for food. God provides food. Their clothing never wear out. Now, can you imagine, beloved, going to uh, the department store and buying a piece of clothing and it stick with you the whole entirety of your life? Never wears out. And so God provides that for them. He provides victory for them over their enemies. And so God is providing all of this. All of it is coming from God. And that's something that we need to learn as well, beloved, is that, that we have a God. We are God's people, and we're to look to Him. If I have a, a, a bill that comes in, He's going to take care of it. I, that actually happened a few weeks ago. We, we had about two or three weeks where there, just everything seemed to be going wrong. I mean, April's, April was sick for, with a respiratory whatever, and then her back was out for a while. Her car had some issues. She was out uh, with a vehicle for a couple of months and ended up costing us quite a bit of money. And I, I just looked one day and I said, Lord, this is your vehicle and, and she is your child. I can't fix either one of those things. You need to take care of this. And, and God's provided. And he does that every single day. We take a lot of those things for granted. But we need to go to him and ask him. And, and then notice also in, in the prayer, not, is, God is in the forefront, but also the last half of the prayer, all the pronouns are plural. He, he says here, uh, starting in verse 4, forgive us, or, or verse 3, I'm sorry, give us each day our daily bread. Verse 4, give, uh, forgive us our sins as we forgive others who sin against us and lead us not into temptation. What that tells us, beloved, is our prayers are, are not only personal, but they're also community-wide. And so there's a couple of things that we see here in the prayer that coincide with what God has said over and over throughout the Scripture. We go back to the Exodus, and at the end of the Exodus, what we see is God gives them how many commandments? Ten. Now, Jesus broke those down into two things, remember? Love the Lord God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul. And the second half of that is love your neighbor as yourself. So we've got ten. The first four to, uh, are revolved around God and, and us lifting up God. The last six are revolved around our, our interpersonal uh, connection between us and, our, and others around us. Jesus breaks that down even further into two. So God is first and then neighbors and everything else come second. That's what's found in this prayer. It coincides with, with the law that Jesus has given, both to love God with all our heart, all our mind, and all our soul, and to love our neighbor as ourselves. By praying for God's glory and God's kingdom, I learn, first of all, that I need to love God with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind. He is at the forefront of my life. And then the second half of that, I'm praying not only for myself, but for others, and so I learn to love others as myself. So let's break this down a little bit further. First of all, when we pray, we should focus on the Father's purpose. That's the first part of this prayer, starting in verse 2. Jesus sets the standard here by telling us how we address God is very, very important. He's the maker of heaven and earth. He's the creator of all things. He is Jehovah God. And so we need to acknowledge that truth, that, that God is above all other things. He's sovereign, he's holy, he's faithful, he's just. Everything about him, beloved, is magnificent. And, and there's a general sense in which God is the father of all people. He created everybody. We, we learn it in, in the book of Acts. But, but since we fell into sin, we're all born separate from God. Jesus even told the Pharisees their father was the devil because they acted like him. And so it's only when a person is reborn, spiritually speaking, by faith in Christ alone, that God will, uh, his will and his power comes in to change us into the child of his in the truest sense. Therefore, the very first prayer, if you have not ever prayed to God, the very first prayer that you need to pray is, Father, forgive me of my sins. And what God does then is he brings you in, he adopts you into his family, and you become a child of his. And then from then on, you can pray, Father. Now that term, in Father, implies a few things. It implies that we know him. We're intimate with him. We have, uh, he loves us. There's, there's a personal relationship that we have. 
in the Old Testament, Israelites did call God Father, but they o- only knew him in a, a, a generic sense. It's used indirectly of somebody that is remote. And so when we come into the Gospels, Jesus changes all that. He speaks of God more than, as a Father more than 70 times. He uses this title in all of his prayers except one. Anybody know where he doesn't use that? When he was hanging on the cross. When he said, my God, my God, why have you, you forsaken me? Every other time he uses the term Father. The term Father ought to encourage us, beloved, to draw closer to God. Because it, it, it brings to mind intimacy and love in this relationship. And just as any earthly father should be, he should show compassion and mercy on his children. John Calvin noted that God is not only a father, but by far the best and kindest father of all fathers. He always welcomes his children into his presence. Now, I sometimes have a pretty busy schedule. Um, Meetings and and talking with folks and, and all that going on. Uh, if there's a call that comes into the church, you guys know the first person you're going to talk to, generally speaking, is Beth. Beth is the secretary here. She answers the phone. Now, occasionally, there will be somebody that calls from a business, and they'll want to talk to the pastor about some promotional deal that they've got going on or something that they want to sell, and she'll, she'll put them on hold and she'll go back to my, she'll come back into my office and say, do you want to talk to so-and-so about this? And a lot of times I'll say, no. <laughs> I don't have time to talk to them about whatever promotion they've got going on. And she'll say, he's busy right now. You can't talk to him. Can you call back later or give him a message? And, and that'll go on. Now, there is one call that if it comes into the offense, it goes straight to me. No questions asked. If any of my kids were to call. That call comes, she doesn't have to ask. Now, my kids, the older ones, have cell phones now, so if they need me, they got a direct line. They don't have to go through the church. But if they were to call, I'm going to speak to them. They had a direct line. There's not going to be questions asked. Whatever they need, they can call because they've got direct access to me because I love them. They're my children, and I'm always available. And it's the same with, with our Heavenly Father. We, we have a direct access access to the Father through the Son by, by, by that faith that we have. And he, He's going to hear us every single time, and He's going to respond as a loving Father would. The term Father also implies respect. You see that in your notes there? Israel tend to view God, again, as this remote God. He's holy, He's righteous, He's, he's far and above anything else. We cannot come near God. That was their understanding. You don't go near God because if you get a glimpse of God, guess what's going to happen? You're going to die right then and there. That, that's it. They learned that in the past because God's sacred. God is a holy God. And, and we can't even come into his dwelling place, can they? You've got the high priest that can only go in there one time of year. And that's, you know, he, he's got to watch out too. And so God is this remote God that is off in a distance. And he's to be revered. He's to be respected. But beloved, Jesus changes that a little bit. I know in our American understanding, we often have God as this, this, this idea that he's like our good buddy in the sky. Whatever we ask, he's going he's gonna to take care of it. But he's a consuming God as well. His glory is blinding. And we don't often fear the chastening hand. We're, we're more like the children who call their dads by the first name. And, and I always wondered why they did that. We're too casual. And so the term father ought to endear us to draw near to God, but it's also it's, it should garner a certain amount of respect because of his authority. The Hebrew, writer put, the Hebrew writer puts it, we have an earthly father to discipline us and we respect them for that. Shall we not much more rather be subjected to the father of spirits and live? So that's why we can draw near to God. We can come into God's presence. We can ask God anything We ought to also give him respect because of his sovereignty. Those are things that we need to keep in balance. God is love, but he's also a God of holiness, and he demands our respect. A third thing we see here with God is is what then is the Father's purpose? 
I mean, our focus in prayer is not for our own needs, but rather it's for God's glory and God's purpose for our lives. In fact, the glory of God is the main purpose of our prayer life. Prayer isn't to get our will done, is it? No, it's thy will be done. And so prayer is to get God's name out there. Our prayer should be focused on the aspects of God's glory, that His name be holy and that His kingdom come. And that's what we see in our text here as Jesus is teaching. His name is to be hallowed. Hallowed is just a, a fancy word to be set apart or to be holy. God's name is holy. It refers not only to how men address God, but, but the person of God. It reflect, reflects His attributes, His actions as revealed in His word. Thus, our prayer should be that the living and true God would be exalted among all people. Everybody, everywhere. Isn't that what we do? We go into our public places and, and we're speaking the gospel. We, we want folks to know that, that we have a holy God. That we have a holy God that loves them. And we have the honor and the privilege to magnify His glory. Glory that He alone deserves. Our God is a mighty God. Amen? It's a prayer that all sin and in irreverence be judged so that men bow in worship before God's holy throne. And that's the focus that we saw all through our Revelation study, wasn't it? That God's name be magnified above all other names. Thus the focus on God's glory was constant through all of Jesus' ministry. In John chapter 17, Jesus declared, Father, the time has come. Glorify your Son that your Son may glorify you. I have brought you glory on the earth by completing the work that you gave me to do. I have revealed you to those whom you gave me out of the world. And so we see that all through Jesus' life, he's fulfilling this prayer that hallow, he hallows the name of the Father. And when we bring this forward, that's the prayer that should be fulfilled in the church. That, that God's name be glorified here. First and foremost. But a lot of times what we see that happens not only in the church, but in the world around us, is that God's name is used in vain. God's, God's name is not set apart as holy. The Apostle Paul cites the psalmist in saying, there's no fear of God before their eyes. And so setting God's name apart as sacred first begins right here in each of our hearts. We submit everything to him, beloved. Everything, your whole life is submitted to magnifying the Lord. We, we take our thoughts captive, as the Apostle Paul says, and we run them through the filter of, of the Spirit in the Scripture. And so everything we say, everything we do must take the Holy God into account because He's the one redeeming us. Remember Ephesians, Paul says, we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works which He created for us in advance. And so we draw near to God in prayer. We, we first must be reverencing His name as holy. Next, the Father's purpose is in that His kingdom come. Second petition in the prayer is, is a logical extension of the first. We, we've covered this to some extent in our Revelation study this part of the prayer points that there is a future day that's coming when Jesus Christ will come in all His power and all His glory and He's going to set up His earthly kingdom. He's going to rule over the nations with an iron scepter. Every single one of us should long for that. For Christ to come back and put down His enemy. That, that every wrong is made right. Beloved, we can also apply that right now. Right now, and you and I can let the Lord rule in our hearts. We don't have to wait for that day to come. So this request acknowledges that God has a right to rule over each of our lives. And so each of us must say, Lord, I, I know your purpose in, in my life supersedes my will. I have desires, I have wants, but those take a backseat, God, to what you want. And so we shouldn't even pray about the basic matters that we have in our life unless we have first yielded to God's glory happening. And we allow Him to reign in our own hearts. That's our first order of business. We submit to Him in obedience. That's what God desires to happen first. 
that his kingdom and his glory be manifested in a very practical way in each of our lives and then in the lives of other believers. That his kingdom be seen in the life of his church. That his kingdom be seen in the life of civic leaders in our city, in our state, in our nation. You know, we just had uh, Memorial Day this past weekend. We're kind of in that season in, in the summer. We, we've got uh, Memorial Day and, and Veterans Day is coming up not too long and the 4th of July. And Our founders said that the foundation of our nation was for the prospering of the gospel. Did you all know that? Samuel Adams, a guy who they don't attribute to saying a whole lot of great things like that, a guy who they attribute more to malt liquor, said that the foundation of our nation was for the prospering of the gospel. That, that's our main purpose, is to get the gospel of Jesus Christ to, to all the rest of the world. And that's what this prayer says. That, that our leaders in the city, in the nation, in the state, that, that our lives in the church ought to be for the spreading of the gospel and the holiness of his people. That his kingdom be manifested right here, right now, and to push against the darkness. So as the scripture says, the gates of hell will not stand. This kind of king, kingdom praying affects our outlook. It should be clear that, that we're engaged in spiritual warfare. You guys know that. We're fighting an enemy that's out there like a roaring lion, seeking who he can devour. And we understand that he has agents that are at work as well. I, I feel it. I don't know if you guys feel it or not. I feel like I'm engaged in a spiritual battle almost every single day. And so we should pray that his, our enemy's work is thwarted, that God confuses the agents of the enemy. Piper points out that in, in wartime, such as a, a nation experienced in World War II, people think and act differently. They have a different purpose in life. Newspapers, all the stories are about the troops and, and, and their families are getting things together. They're, they're talking about their sons and their daughters on the front lines. They, they pray for their safety. That They pray for all of these great things to happen. It's, it's different when we pray like that. When we're focused on a war that's going on. And then Piper, Piper says this, So what is prayer for? Prayer is for war. It's not for civilian life. The primary function of prayer is for battle. And we often use it like taking a wartime walkie-talkie and turning it into a domestic intercom. That is not what it's supposed to be used for. We're on a battleship, not a cruise ship. And so when we pray, our first focus should be on the Father's purpose, namely that his, his name is hallowed and that his kingdom come. And after that, then he permits us to focus on what we need. And here's the thing. The second half of this prayer, our needs are focused on the first half of that prayer as well. There's a link between those two sections. Because if you'll notice, the portion that covers provision, pardon, and protection they're so that we can get that first part done. God, provide protection for me, provide a pardon for me, provide provision for me so that your kingdom can come, so that your will is done. I want to accomplish the Father's purpose. And in order to do that, God is providing all of these other things. It's not for my happiness. Although that sometimes is an outcome. You know, God says, you focus on me first and then I'll give you the desires of your heart. So rather, the Father's providing what we need so that we can then fulfill the purpose that he's given us. Daily bread here is a figure of speech that refers to basic provision. God, give me basic provisions for today. It, it, it goes back to the Exodus. What did they require every single day? Manna. Man in the morning, man in the evening, man at supper time. That's what I need, Lord. Also, give me some water. I need some water to wash it all down. And, and so God's providing every single day as they travel through the wilderness. The only day that changes is when the Sabbath comes. Then they can get a double portion. But you can't stockpile it. You can't store it up. And what, what God is teaching them, beloved, is a daily dependence on him. 
What do I need for today? I'm not worried about tomorrow. Tomorrow's going to have enough problems of its own. What do I need right now? And God says, I'll take care of that. I will bless the necessity that you have today. You're going to have plenty of weeks and months and years to come ahead. Don't worry about that. I'm going to take care of what you need right now in this instance. And so we thank God for our food. We thank God for our clothing. We thank God for our finances to pay our bills every single day. And we understand that we're dependent upon Him in this moment. You're dependent on your next breath. No, God numbers the hairs on your head. God numbers the days of your life. The very next breath that you're going to get is dependent upon the Lord providing the air that you breathe. You know, if, if the earth were to move one degree closer to the sun or one degree farther to the sun, it would be in hop, in he- We couldn't live here. <laughs> Getting tongue-tied here this morning. And so God provides even the next breath. And so we're focused on, on Him. The next thing we see is we have a need for pardon. Just as bread is the basic need for our bodies, pardon, forgiveness, is the basic need for our soul. We understand, as Paul says in Romans, we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And yet, as believers in Christ, we have this assurance that we're covered by the blood. We're covered. Our sins have been cleansed. But here's the thing about that. We need a daily reminder that every day, that blood needs to cleanse. Every day, in order for us to have a clear conscience, we need to understand, regardless of my eternal standing, I understand that I am, I am safe in the hands of Jesus. Don't worry about that. If you're a believer, God has bought you, He's paid for you with the blood of Christ, you don't have to worry about losing your salvation. But the relationship that I have with Him right now is based on me asking forgiveness. If I love my children, all four of them. But occasionally they do things that upset me. And, and I may say, well, you know, you guys have upset me. We need to, we need to do something about the relationship that we have. And so that needs, that's a daily thing that needs to be taken care of. And it's the same with God. We daily need to go to Him and, and make sure this relationship that we have with Him is on good standings. And so here on earth, as a father, I was born in my family, I, I'm always going to be my father's son. But again, that relationship has to be maintained. We're we're rebels at heart. You know that? Every single one of us. And so Jesus ties our forgiveness before God the Father with our forgiving those who've also wronged us. God, forgive us. Give us this forgiveness. And it's only granted on the basis of His grace, not our works. So here's the idea. We're sinful. We mess up, and if, if we don't show mercy to others in the little things that, that's gone on between us, why should we expect to get mercy from a Heavenly Father that's forgiven us about major things? So this, this interpersonal relationship also points to the fact that we are rebels, and we have a holy and righteous God who wants to maintain Goodness, and, and how, what's our testimony going to be if, if we've got all this trouble between us and bitterness that's, that's happening? And so this means that our relationship with God is inextric- inextricably linked with our relationship with everybody else, especially with those in our family and in our church. And so we can't just walk away from a stained relationship as if it doesn't matter. If we're bitter, that bitterness is going to play in our relationship with God and in our worship. Lastly, we have a need for protection from sin and so the final petition here lead us not into temptation it's more likely a figure of speech that jesus has used here Uh, i mean the interpretation is is a little difficult because james tells us in james chapter one god does not tempt anybody god doesn't cause us to be tempted into anything but james says there in uh, chapter one verse 13 that we're tempted by our own sinful lust and then he instructs on, we should count it all joy when we encounter various trials and temptations. Because those two things are often interchanged. And so we need to ask, why would Jesus tell us to pray for something that God would not do? And it, if it's going to be beneficial for us, why should we pray that God would spare us from something that's going to be for our good? 
And so the best interpretation, I think, to say is that Jesus is using a figure of speech here to tell us to avoid sin, resist it. Thus, he means that we should cultivate an attitude of fleeing from every situation where we might fall into something that is contrary to what God teaches. And so we ask, I can't do that on my own. So we ask the Father to help us in that. And so the idea here is that far from leading us into temptation, which he cannot do, God will lead us into his ways of righteousness where he will be, we will be kept from sinning. And so the prayer is, lead us not into temptation, is the acknowledgement of the weakness of the sinfulness of our hearts. And it's admission that God, if we're to withdraw from his gracious hand, then we're definitely going to fall into sin immediately. And so we're asking, Father, can you help us in this purpose and keep us focused on anything that might hinder us from your will or your glory? If we desire to pray as we're taught to pray here, then we should want to focus on the Father's purpose. That His name be holy, that His kingdom come, and we'll have the, the, the desire to meet His needs for our provision, for, his, for our pardon, and for our protection. Not so that we're cozy and happy, but so as a family, we need to have what we're, God wants us to have to carry out His purpose in this world. So Lord, teach us how to pray. Let's stand and give God glory this morning.